Good morning, and welcome to the Third Dimension Blog Podcast. My name is Robert Novell. I will be your host as we look back at the history of aviation, as well as touch on other subjects from time to time that are of special importance to us as aviators. This week's quote comes to us courtesy of K.O. Eklund, and is one of my favorite. Within all of us is a varying amount of space lint and stardust, the residue from our creation. Most are too busy to notice it, and it is stronger in some than others. It is strongest in those of us who fly and is responsible for an unconscious, subtle desire to slip into some wings and try for the elusive boundaries of our origin. Interesting viewpoint that I agree with and I think all aviators can relate to. Now, let's talk about the golden years of aviation and the CAB. Job security, protected seniority, retirement. They had it all. Between 1935 and 1965, the pay for pilots and all aviation professionals working in the airline industry was stable, predictable, and rewarding. Sure, there were bumps in the road, but all in all, I think you can refer to this era as the golden years. The stability and lifestyle of the pilots, cabin crew, mechanics, and all other employees during this period will not likely be repeated in the future. There are some exceptions to this statement in the 21st century, but by and large, those days are gone. The pilots during this period were paid well, they had a protected industry, and their retirement plan actually stayed intact after they retired, so they were able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. However, the problems created for the trunk carriers during this period were only fully realized in the late 90s and still plague the industry now as the legacy legacy carriers continue to fight for their survival. Let me explain the difference between trunk and legacy. A trunk carrier is a carrier that operated under the CAB, and a legacy carrier is any carrier that was operating when deregulation occurred in 1978. There were 26 carriers, plus or minus, in 1978, and the number of legacy carriers still operating today is only five if you include Southwest. So was deregulation a good thing? Was the CAB a good thing? Let's talk about the CAB, and then in a later podcast, I will editorialize a bit on the mistakes that were made in 1978. Birth of the Civil Aeronautics Board The roller coaster years that preceded the Civil Aviation Act of 1938 should have been viewed as growing pains for the newly founded airlines and handled accordingly. However, by 1935, the federal government had begun a comprehensive economic regulation of the banking, rail, trucking, inner-city bus, and other industries. This trend reflected a general loss of confidence in free markets during the Great Depression, and the core objective in this new wave of, re- uh, new wave of regulation was to restrict or eliminate competition. It is important to understand that this was a complete reversal of the Roosevelt's administration position in 1932. However, at this time there was a war in progress in Asia, and it was rapidly approaching Europe, plus the United States was still trying to get its house back in order after the Great Depression. The aviation industry was considered an important link to national defense, and the newly formed Civil Aeronautics Board established by Congress through the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938 was expected to ensure their survival and prepare the newly formed airlines for the vital roles they were be expected to play in the coming years. All modes of transportation were just as vital as the airlines, but it was the airlines and the associated growth in aviation technology, followed by rail, trucking, and others that allowed our country to be successful on the road to recovery and beyond. The newly created CAB, an agency that now controlled all of the domestic markets, was also responsible for establishing the quantity of service and the pricing of that service. It did so by deciding where each airline could fly, how many flights should be taken, and how many seats they could offer. They were also responsible for setting minimum and maximum fares. Once airlines acquired authority to operate between two cities, they were obligated to operate a minimum number of flights and needed CAB approval to abandon that route if it proved unprofitable. The CAB rarely approved an airline to do so because they felt if an airline was receiving a reasonable rate of return on a profitable route, then this would subsidize service on the marginal unprofitable routes. Essentially, the CAB controlled the profits, and whenever an airline got into financial trouble, the CAB would simply arrange a merger with a healthier airline. This proved to be a nice, neat, bureaucratic fix to a problem they had created. 
1940, the Roosevelt administration reorganized the entities created by the Civil, Aer- Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938 and consolidated the powers of the CAB over the airline industry. The CAA and the CAB now constituted a formidable political subsystem that created a mutually beneficial alliance between the CAB, the airline industry, and key congressional committees and subcommittees. The stability of this system proved to be a primary impediment to the creation of the FAA. However, the FAA did end up winning this particular tough battle. Regulated stability was a costly venture. Airlines could not respond quickly to changes in demand, wages were high, and supply exceeded demand. Airlines routinely operated at load factors less than 50%, and the protected environment kept prices high. Demand for flights was low, and as a result, air travel was only available to the affluent few who could afford it. It is fair to say that in the 21st century, it is hard to imagine the U.S. government introducing legislation with the core belief that competition had to be restricted or eliminated, or is it? However, there was a real need for this concept initially because of the pending World War, but still, to have this type of legislation stay in place for 40 years was clearly the wrong decision, and when President Jimmy Carter finally dismantled the CAB with the the Deregulation Act of 1978, the trunk carriers of the protected era paid a very heavy price. I know that I may have been brief in the presentation of facts surrounding the Air Commerce Act of 1938 and the CAB, but I have done so purposely. It can be all too easy to become entwined in the minutiae of the bureaucracy of the U.S. government during the 30s and 40s. So for now, I think we'll stop it here. But I do have one closing comment. The airlines do in fact have some of the responsibility for the events that led to bankruptcy, union contracts being dissolved, and insolvent pension plans. However, the CAB and the Carter administration are the primary culprits, and we cannot forget that. Next week, we'll continue our look back, but for now, I want to say thanks for stopping by, and I look forward to being with you again next week, when once again, we'll talk about the history of our profession. Until then, take care, fly safe, and remember, all aviators are gatekeepers.